Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our class on corporations and business law. My name is George Geis, and I want to talk to you today about a topic that I'll bet many of you have probably never heard of. It's called the law of agency or agency law. And if you're like me, when you were getting ready for law school, when you are getting ready for law school, you may have looked at some of those books that um, prepare you on you know, being a successful law student. They all have funny names, like how to slay the law school dragon, right? Or how to exercise the law school demon, law school confidential. And I think they do a pretty good job of talking you through the basic 1L classes, torts and criminal law and maybe contracts. But they don't say anything, usually, about agency law. Nevertheless, I would contend that agency law is a really important foundational critical area of the law. In fact, it used to be a required first year class several decades ago. So, you say, um, what is it? What is it? Well, you've probably heard of a real estate agent or a sports agent or a movie star agent, um, but the truth of the matter is that anyone can have an agent. In fact, I'll bet some of you right now might have an agent, perhaps without even realizing it. And you say, well, OK, so what? Who cares? Well, you should care. Because under the right circumstances, agency law says that you might be legally responsible for the acts of somebody else. I'll say that again. You might be legally responsible for the acts of somebody else. You say, Professor Geis, I can barely be responsible for my own hacks, and now you're telling me that I'm going to be on the hook for something that somebody else does? And the answer is yes, possibly so. OK, you say, how do I know if I have one of these agency things? And I would say, well, the answer depends on three critical factors. You're going to have to look at any situation and ask whether three things are present. First off, agency is going to be an agreement that results from an agreement between the principal and an agent, that the agent shall act on behalf of the principal and be subject to his or her control. Now, with this control element, it's important to emphasize that you don't have to micromanage what it is that the agent is doing. You don't have to say, do this, do this, do this, do this. You just have to have the general ability to direct you know, what it is that they're trying to accomplish. And if those three things are present, then you're going to you know, create something that is going to be formally known as an agency relationship. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, many of you might be familiar, again, with a real estate agent. And a real estate agent is somebody that is just you know, empowered by a home purchaser or a home seller to try to enter in a contract on your behalf, perhaps even without, you know, without your ultimate um, you know, your, your knowledge of every single thing that they're doing. Or similarly, think about senior executives at a large corporation. Perhaps someone like Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg at Meta, the company that was formerly known as Facebook. Um, how does Facebook do anything? How does Facebook do anything? You know, sometimes you hear remarks like, corporations are people too. And I think there's a whole interesting you know, um, dialogue and discussion about what exactly does it mean for corporations to be separate legal entities. Because they are, in the eyes of the law, they're separate legal entities. But, you know, and, and that's, you know, there's a whole you know, interesting conversation about what does that mean and what rights should corporations have and what rights do they have. Um, but when it comes down to sort of the, the, the final analysis, corporations aren't physical people. Right? I don't care you know, what you think about what their rights should be. They're not physical people. And so the only way that a company like Meta can do anything, at least for now, is through the acts of its agents. It's going to have hundreds, maybe hundreds of thousands of agents, and each of those agents are going to be doing something for the corporate principle. That's why agency law is usually the very first thing that you'll learn whenever you're studying business law, whenever you're studying corporate law, right? Because the only way that corporations can act is through their agents. Now, maybe this will change. I don't know. I've read some science fiction lately talking about smart contracting and you know sentient corporations and maybe someday they'll be able to sort of create their own algorithms and do things on their own and, and not need agents as much as they currently do but for now corporate law starts with agency law and that's where we're going to begin okay armed with this knowledge i want to put you in the position of judge and jury and ask you to help me decide a few cases 
Um, I handed out one case you know, in the back of the room. Maybe you've seen it before. I don't want to actually start with that case right now. I want to begin with another case. I'll tell you the facts, and we'll use it to sort of illustrate this question of whether we've created an agency relationship. Again, here are the main principles we're going to be looking at. So here's our starting story. Um, one day, there was um, a high school with a teacher named Miss Doty. The case is called Dorton B. Doty. I think it was in uh, the state of Idaho. And Miss Doty was over by the coffee machine talking with the football coach, Coach Garst. And they were talking about the upcoming football game. Uh, apparently, Coach Garst was going to be taking a group of students over to an away football game that Friday night. And Miss Doty said, well, Coach, um, I understand you're driving all the players in cars. You're not taking a bus. Do you have all of the vehicles that you need to take the students over to the game? And the coach said, oh, Miss Doty, actually, um, we need one more car. We're a little bit short. And Miss Doty said, oh, OK, I'll tell you what. You can use my car to take the students to the football game, but only if you drive it. I don't want one of those you know, hyped up 17-year-olds driving my car. If you drive my car, Coach Garst, then you can go ahead and use it. And Coach said, great, thank you, I will. Took the car, went to the game. Don't know if they won or lost. On the way home from the game, unfortunately, um, there was an accident. And Coach Garst crashed Miss Doty's car. One of the students, and, and let's just stipulate, let's just assume that Coach was behaving negligently when he drove her car home. Right, let's just assume that he committed a legal wrong, he committed a tort, he didn't drive the car appropriately, and he was negligent in the way that he was operating the car. One of the students who was riding with him, Gordon, was hurt and had some medical bills, some fairly significant medical bills. Now, let me pause for a minute and ask you to put on your plaintiff lawyer's hat. Imagine that young Mr. Gordon and his family come into your law offices and say, this is kind of an unfortunate situation. My son was just riding home in his car. Now he's had a bunch of medical bills. Um, we'd like to perhaps recover from somebody for those expenses. Putting on your plaintiff's hat, who might you tell young Mr. Gorton to sue? Any ideas? Yeah. The school. You might start with the school. How come? Because uh, the coach was acting on behalf of the school. Okay. And so maybe the coach was sort of a, a representative of the school, and they should be the one that's responsible here. I might start with someone else even before the school. Who else in the back? Ms. Doty, oh, you want to go straight to the poor, nice teacher that donated her car. Who else should we sue here? Yeah. Why not go after the coach? If he's the one that we've stipulated is a bad driver and caused this problem, I would think that he personally might be the first place I would go. Um, unfortunately, it was a really serious accident, and the coach died in the accident. And apparently, the coach didn't have an estate or resources to recover. Um, so the coach was out. Um, and also, under some laws at the time, the school was out. There was some sort of a sovereign immunity law that you know, applied in, in Idaho at the time. And I guess it was a public school. I don't know that that would be the result today. But at the time, the school also was not a viable defendant. And so Gorton decided to sue Miss Doty. Now, what do you think about the merits of this case was going to turn on whether Ms. Doty was legally responsible for the coach's negligent driving. And that, in turn, was going to depend on whether or not we had an agency relationship. Someone tell me what you think. Is there an agency relationship that was created between Ms. Doty and Coach Garst? And if so, why? If not, why not? Okay. Nobody wanted him to behave negligently. I, 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 I'm hundred percent sure you're right. You know, I'm sure she didn't say, "Here's my car. Um, you can use it as long as you drive, and as long as you drive recklessly." <laughs> right? I'm sure that's not that's not the case. Let's go through it all one by element. Do we see an agreement here? There's not. It looks like there's an agreement, right? There was an agreement that she'd lend the car and that he would drive the car for the specific purpose. What about? Subject, let's drop to the bottom one, subject to his or her control. Was the coach subject to Miss Doty's control? I see some nods. Why? I think he was because she said only if you drive the car. Okay. There's at least a, 
there's at least a little bit of an indicator that she had some overall direction or authority for how the car was going to be used. I don't want a 17-year-old driving it. I want you to drive it. You know, there's also at least some control over where he was going to be driving the car. She didn't say, here's my car, joyride. Right? I mean, she said, take it to the game. So I think we can make out a reasonable argument that those two elements are present. What about this middle one? Was Coach Garst acting on behalf of Miss Doty in this situation? Yeah, the best. I feel like her intent was not to drive the car herself, so she might not have, or he might not have been acting on her behalf, because had she not went in the car, uh, she wouldn't have driven the student herself. Okay. So Coach wasn't doing anything that she would have had to do herself. So that means no behalf? Uh, I could see that, you know, if she had asked him to do it, I guess it, it would be on her behalf. Close call. Other thoughts? Yeah. I would say no, just because she doesn't have any interest in this. Like, he's doing this on his own interest for his own benefit. Okay. She's, like, just trying to be helpful, so she's not... Okay. So, so she's, she's not receiving any personal benefit from this transactional relationship. That's fine. But she wanted to help out. So okay. I think that part of her donation... So the benefit that she got was good feeling about helping out the school? Is that enough? I, I mean, I say no, because she also did not have any obligation to provide that car either. Didn't have to do it. She might have felt good about doing it. Yeah? Uh, I would say no, because the like, public transit doesn't hold every taxpayer responsible individually for the car for the accident the bus driver caused. Yeah, but we're talking about private law here. Right? I mean, that's a little bit of a different situation, isn't it? She, she was offering, basically, she was lending something. She was not. Well, that's what we're trying to define. Was it a loan or was it an agency relationship? Right? I mean, if it was just sort of a donor donee relationship, then you're right. I, don't, I think that's the case. But we've got to figure out kind of which side of the line we're on. And we may very well be on that side of the line. But in order to figure it out, we've got to figure out first. Do we have one of these agency relationships? And it's going to turn on these factors. Yeah, I think so, yes, because it's provided that he drives the vehicle. So otherwise, that condition would have been met. Well, that goes to control, doesn't it? That goes to agreement. How is that helping her? Yeah, in the back. Well, also, she didn't approach him. He approached her yeah. asking for the car, which leads me to believe that, no, he is not acting on her behalf. Okay. What would her benefit, or why would it be on her behalf? In the back. Um, so I was thinking that. Because at the end of the day, it was her intent to get the kids to the game. Okay. Um, and so as a result, because that was her intention, um, he was acting as an agent for her to achieve that end result, whether or not um, you know, it was his idea or her idea. Okay. Um, so school spirit. She felt good about supporting the school. And that benefited her. That was something where he was acting on her behalf to boost her school spirit. Let me ask for a vote. How many of you think an agency relationship was created and Miss Doty's going to be liable for the tort. How do you think? No way, no relationship, no. Well, most of you think that there is not an agency relationship. The court said there was. The court said there is an agency relationship here. There was an agreement for control for reasons that we talked about where it was conditioned. Um, and she got some benefit that the court didn't really explain in a lot of detail. This was a really controversial case. I'm not sure that I would have decided this case the way that the court did here. I think it's one of many cases you'll study in law school where you need to really question whether the judge got it right. But I think for our purposes, it's a very nice illustration of how we might need to go through these elements in order to figure out what exactly is our legal relationship. Is it an agency relationship or is it something else? Let's try a couple of hypotheticals. Here's my pen. Are you my agent? No, why not? Okay, so what? Okay, so there's no agreement. You took it. Do we have an implicit agreement? Okay. <laughs> Let's assume you did. Here's my pen, and you take it. Are you my agent? 
even then. No, right? We're in sort of a donor donee relationship. I've just given you something, but I'm not controlling anything you do with the pen, right? You're not doing anything on my behalf, right? I've just sort of given you my pen. I'll take it back. <clears throat> Here's my pen. Will you sell it for me? And you say yes. Are you my agent? How come? Because we made an agreement and I'm acting on your behalf to sell the pen for you. Okay. And you do still have some control over the situation. Okay. So probably so, right? I'm directing sort of what you do with the pen. You're agreeing to try to sell it to me to help me out. I think there's a reasonable chance. Here's my pen. You buy my pen from me for fair value, let's say it's $5, because you're in the pen resale business and you think you might be able to sell it for more. Are you my agent? No. Why not? Because I'm acting on my own behalf. Okay. We're in a contractual relationship. We're in a supplier, you know, retailer relationship or whatever it is. You're not my agent, right? You're not doing anything on my behalf. You're doing something on your behalf because that's the business you're in. You know, we could go on and on. Some really interesting cases can arise when you're dealing with consignment relationships. I don't know if any of you know about consignment, right, where you give your product to a store and they hold it for a while and they say, hey, at some point if it sells, you know, we'll split the proceeds. Those can be really close cases. Many of them are viewed as agency relationships, assuming that the consignment retailer has the right to, or sorry, assuming that the person that puts it to consignment has the right to pull it back. But there can be some really close cases along those lines. Okay, let's continue. Um, I want to step back for just a minute and talk about some of the broader consequences of establishing an agency relationship. So far, we've been focused mostly on the formation question. Do you have an agency relationship or do you have something else? Once you have an agency relationship, then a whole bunch of consequences follow. There's a whole host of things that will follow. Um, I won't list them all, but I'll list a few. Usually, the way to analyze this is to draw three parties on the board, the principal, the agent, and then some other third party, and then to just um, talk about what agency relationships mean. The most important, or one of the first and most important ones, is that an agent can bind the principal to other people in contract law. Again, that's a lot of times why, as a corporation, you might want to have agents, employees, people working for you, because they're going to be able to write contracts that you think are good ones. A second consequence is that the principal might be responsible for the torts or the legal wrongs of the agent. I've seen an example of that already, right, with Ms. Doty. Third consequence is a really important one. The agent is going to owe fiduciary duties or heightened duties to the principal. What do we mean by this? Well, the relationship of an agent and a principal is not sort of an arm's length contractual relationship. It's a special relationship. There's going to be heightened obligations. The agent is really going to have to do a lot of things that look out for the principal and do not put themselves first. And in corporate law, um, a lot of what you're going to study is going to be devoted to unpacking what these fiduciary relationships look like. What are the obligations of you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg and all the other people that are serving as agents of various corporations? Um, and there's lots of them, and, th and it's also a really you know, important area of the law that was born, if you will, in the law of agency. Okay, I'm going to skip over consequence number one, and I think we have time for one or two more cases relating to consequence number two, situations where principal might be responsible for the torts of the agent. Um, but I need to um, give you a little more law so you can be an informed judge. Um, we're going to work with a theory called respondeat superior. Respondeat superior. Um, it means, um, in a nutshell, let the employer answer for the torts of the employee. And in order to have this type of liability, vicarious liability, right, where the principal is going to be liable, you need to have a couple of factors. First, you've got to have a really close agency relationship. You can have looser agency relationships, perhaps like Ms. Doty, but for respondeat superior, you've got to have a closer relationship where the agent is an employee and not just an independent contractor. More on that in a second. And second, the tort or the wrong needs to be committed within the scope of employment. Now, that can usually mean one of a couple things. So again, you want to have an employee, not an independent contractor, and the wrong has been committed within the scope of employment. Usually that's defined to mean a purpose to serve. 
the wrong was committed while the agent was trying to serve the employer, trying to sort of carry out the business, or this wrong was a foreseeable result of the overall relationship, of the situation. So those are sort of the factors that we're going to want to look to whenever we're talking about whether there's respondeat superior liability. Now, I'll say a little bit more about um, the first one. Um, I won't go through all these factors. There's a lot of legal factors that you might use to try to distinguish whether you're an independent contractor or whether you're an employee. Um, if you want a mental model for two types of agents that might fall on either side of the line, you might think about two different types of gardeners. But on the one hand, think about a gardener that um, services dozens of different properties. They have their own equipment in the back of their own trucks. They come every couple weeks. They mow the lawn. They blow the leaves. They go. That's probably going to be someone who's viewed as an independent contractor type agent and not as an employee agent. You know, conversely, think about a live-in gardener at a fancy mansion on a show like Downton Abbey or something like that, right? They're in the back shed. They live on the property. All of the gardening equipment belongs to the, the home itself. And every morning they sort of get up and they talk to the owners and they say, what do you want you know, us to work on today? They say, oh, why don't you, um, you know, trim the boxwood or prune the begonias or whatever it is, right? Um, that looks more like an employee type relationship. So hopefully you can kind of get, get the point. Okay. Now we're ready to apply this to another case. And I think we can turn to the main case, the one that I handed out earlier um, called Ira Bushy and Sons versus the United States. Some of you might have had a chance to take a look at this. If you haven't, don't worry. I can kind of tell you what's going on uh, quickly uh, uh, right now. The case involved um, a U.S. Coast Guard ship that was sitting in a dry dock in Brooklyn, New York. And I guess the ship was in for some repair work. And the um, dry dock owner and the Coast Guard had worked out an arrangement where all the sailors on the ship were going to continue to live on the ship while the ship was being repaired. And they'd worked out some sort of a um, system where the sailors were going to be taking some shore leave and going off to New York and then coming back and sleeping on the ship. And that would allow them to sort of um, house the sailors while these repairs were, were being made. Well, one of the sailors named Lane went out one night with some of his friends and Lane got drunk. Apparently Lane got very, very drunk, because walking back home, as he crossed into the dry dock, he noticed that there were a bunch of valves on the side of the dry dock. And he decided that he was going to spin three of the valves 20 times. Went back to the ship, muttered something about spinning the valves, went to bed. A few minutes later, it turned out that those valves were basically controlling sort of the water intake on the side of the dry dock. Water rushed in, the ship tilted over, damaged the dry dock. Ira Bushy is the owner of the dry dock. Ira Bushy is quite upset, as you might imagine. Um, Ira Bushy is looking for people to recover from, and Sailor Lane doesn't seem like a very promising prospect. We're not sure that Sailor Lane has um, the resources to pay for the damage to the dry dock. So Ira Bushy, you know, scratches their heads and consults with some attorneys and says, last I checked, the United States has a fair amount of money. Maybe I'll recover from the U.S. Sues the U.S., and now we have to apply our theory. Two, big, two major issues. First, was Lane an employee-type agent or an independent contractor-type agent of the Coast Guard? And second, was Lane acting within the scope of employment when he did this? Start with question number one. Any volunteers to sort of help us figure out what type of agent was Lane? I mean, I don't believe you're an employee because, um, especially with the military position, if you leave, you're going to be corrupted. There's a good chance you'll face some pretty serious legal repercussions. So you're not exactly free to come and go and change your employment. So that's a uh, I also had to be an independent contractor as a service member. Okay. Unless what? you're uh, employed as one, not a direct uh, act. So we do have like, independent contractors, but okay. as a sailor. Yeah, I mean, the case is an old case, right? I think we're talking 50 or 60 years ago. Every morning when Lane got up, you think he sort of um, scratched his head and said, hmm, what should I do today? 
maybe I'll swab the decks, right? Or maybe I'll fit out the rigging here, or maybe I'll increase the spars there. What do you think? I guess if they're docked and not doing anything, they might have more leeway in his day to day actions, but maybe in general, that's not. Anyone serve in the Coast Guard? I would ask. Anyone serving in the military? All right, well, then we'll have to speculate. Anyone think that Lane had very much autonomy over how he spent his time on a day-to-day -day basis? No. no, why not? I'll bet that's what was going on. Yeah, I'll bet that was going on. I mean, moreover, right, I think Lane didn't own any of the ship's equipment himself. Right, I think Lane was probably following you know, orders most of the time when he was carrying out his duties. Um, it wasn't like Lane had lots of other ships that he was working for. I mean, it, it looks to me like this is a pretty clear-cut case as Lane being an employee agent um, under the very close supervision of the Coast Guard. So for Ira Bushy, so far so good. Looks like we might have um, a viable respondeat superior claim. Now we need to come to issue number two, whether or not Lane acting within the scope of employment during this incident. And before we get into our discussion, I want to ask for a, uh, a vote. How many of you think Lane was acting within the scope of employment when he did this? And how of you think, no way? All right, we're almost 50-50, maybe 60-40. Um, let me hear some analysis. Those of you that thought he was acting within the scope of employment first, why? By the terms of his employment, he's required to sleep on the ship by the Coast Guard. Therefore, okay. he was on his way following those duties to get back to the ship after his um, shore leave. Okay. Supposed to sleep on the ship, walking back to the ship when this happened. Uh, even if testing the valves is in his purpose to serve, I think it does that like John should have been a foreseeable result. Okay. So there's two sub-factors, as, um, as you point out. One is that we might say, this happens within the scope of employment if you have a purpose to serve. And if not, it could be within the scope of employment if this is a foreseeable result of the situation. So we could even break it down further, right? Um, is there a purpose to serve? What do you think was going through Lane's mind when he spun the valves? Maybe not much, right? <laughs> Maybe not much at all. But if we had to speculate, I mean, do we, let me put it this way. Do we think he was saying, OK, well, um, I need to really help out the Coast Guard. And the best way that I can help out the Coast Guard right now at midnight, um, after I've been drinking all day, is to spin all these valves that belong to the dry dock 20 times. I'm helping out my, 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 uh, you know, my employer. <laughs> OK. It's possible. You know, it's possible. Um, I'm, I'm more inclined to think what some of you suggested, that he just didn't have that thought. But let's hear, let's hear from some others. I think maybe it's the fact that he was in a drunken state suggests that he wasn't thinking he was going to be working that evening. Okay. Um, I hardly remember when he would get inebriated to start working. Okay. So maybe. Okay. So maybe the fact that he had gone off on shore leave and was coming back makes it less likely that he thought he was you know, doing something with the purpose to help out the Coast Guard. I'm on my off time. Right. I, I don't know that any of us know what he was thinking. Yeah. I think partially that narrative of the incoherent mumbling of, oh, yeah, I spin the valves, I think helps uh, contribute to that picture that he, he didn't know what he was doing. Okay. Or that he, he, I mean, he didn't say, I spun the valve so I could help out the Coast Guard. Right? I spun the valve so that we could just get out of this dry dock faster, right? We're done. We've got to get back out to sea. I don't think there's anything that there. Yeah, I was going to say, like, it, it could even be argued that it was malicious, uh, intent almost, like a yeah. prank. And I feel like that would preclude any sort of uh, he was performing a duty. All right, so maybe it's the opposite of a purpose to serve, right? P purpose to you know, delay, right? Let's have some more shore leave and spin the vow. Um, so I don't know that that's what an easy one for us to argue is present. But you mentioned that this was a foreseeable result. This was a foreseeable result. Um, before coming into this classroom, how many of you have ever heard of a Coast Guard ship docked where a drunken sailor had spun valves and damaged the dry dock? Foreseeable? Maybe the general principle more than the specific. OK, what do you mean? Um, oh, well, I got, I got some of that from this document. They're arguing that. 
you're, I mean, you're right. You're right. I mean, let's just let's be frank, right? This is what the judge said. So I guess I'm questioning whether the judge is right. Uh, maybe the, the stereotype of a sailor who's drinking too much goes back pretty far. Okay. And then coming back late, shorty near stuff that is sensitive. Like okay. That, so. so I don't know. May, maybe it's reasonable to say that it's foreseeable that there might be some inebriation. Um, maybe it's foreseeable that you might come back inebriated. It's a little tougher for me to say it's foreseeable that a drunken sailor would spin three valves 20 times and damage the dry dock. What do you think? If it's a foreseeable, So whose responsibility is it going to be? Whose responsibility is it going to be? I mean, that in part is kind of what we're trying to decide. I guess Ira Bushy would say, maybe we should have, but we didn't. And it's not our employees that did the damage. It's the agent of the Coast Guard. And so if we can make out a respondeat superior claim, then why shouldn't we be able to recover? I mean, I think your question is interesting because it started to get at the next topic I want to ask about, which is, what do we think is going to happen in the world after this decision in similar situations? But first, I want to sort of hammer this one home and see whether we really think this is a foreseeable result and whether the test should, should properly apply. I was just going to say that, based off of what you were just saying, it could almost be like a counterclaim or something that the agents of Arabushi were not like doing their fiduciary duty of like care, like the duty of care by like investigating what it was that we were talking about and kind of like so, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, again, kind of policy question about um, if we place the burden of liability on one side or the other, what is it going to mean for the activities of future parties? Um, you know, and may, maybe we should talk about that. Um, I think this issue of foreseeability one is a tricky one, right? I think, I think Judge Friendly is, is using that absolutely, right? Because Friendly says, um, nice name, right? Judge Friendly. I, I, this, isn't going to work, purpose to serve, but I still feel like Bushy should be able to recover. Doesn't look like Lane did a great thing. Maybe I can make out a claim with an or support a claim that uses an alternative test that's a foreseeability test. Um, I would argue that it's not that foreseeable that this exact thing would happen. Anyone know what the judge does to sort of solve that problem? I wouldn't even characterize what the judge does. Yeah. yeah. That uh, it's foreseeable that a drunk person may act in a way that would do damage. Okay. And so that incites like hurting an employee or taking property into the water. Yeah. And you consider the spinning of the valve as a damage. So we should recognize that judicial move here, right? He's basically moved the zoom lens a little bit back and said, you know, it's not foreseeable that this specific thing would happen. But it's foreseeable, when we broaden it, that a sailor might go off on shore leave, come back, and do damage in some way to the dry dock. And therefore, this test holds. And, and I think you, know, you could agree with that. You could disagree with that. But we should just recognize explicitly that's how the judge is deciding this case. OK, now I want to come to the question that a couple of you have already started to, to, to bring us to. What's going to be the result of this decision on the future activity of parties in similar situations? Any thoughts? If you're the Coast Guard and you lose this case, are you going to do anything differently next time around? Oh, yeah, write the contract differently. Okay, how would you write the contract? Specify who will be responsible if an event like this were to happen or if there's similar events. Okay. We'd like to repair on your dry dock, and if any of our sailors get drunk and break your dry dock by spinning valves, you're responsible. Uh, if I try, right? And the dry dock might say, okay, that's fine. The price just went up, <laughs> right? I mean, there may be a price adjustment. Yeah. Uh, more strictly regulate the drinking of your agents. Okay. Maybe we should be a little more careful with both who we bring on as our agents and second, exactly how they spend their shore leave. I think that's a, a, a likely result. Yeah. I think they would take more care as far as probably posting a sailor uh, at the entrance, okay. so maybe at like the security gate or at the ship itself. Yeah, I think they had one security um, agent right at the, the entrance point, but it may very well be that they'd march three or four people right all along the whole path just to try to pre prevent something like this from happening. Yeah. We don't put sailors on the, on the ship 
Okay. Don't put them on the ship, right? Let's find another hotel because it's just too expensive for us to run the risk of something like this happening. Okay, so that raises an interesting question. Can you predefine your relationship? Well, I guess it depends, right, on whether the law allows you to say, um, I'd like to hire you to come work with me. Um, and um, I've decided and you've agreed that you're not going to be my agent as part of our relationship. Can we pre-commit to that? Well, what if you make the agreement as an explicit time that you are now no longer my agent from the back to back and you actually make within this time scale you're not on my behalf? I mean, I think it's an interesting question, the extent to which you should have private freedom to predefine whether you're an agent or when you're an agent or not. Um, I want to come back to that question in a second because I want to talk a little bit more about you know, what we think the overall reason we have this law is and whether or not allowing people to, to, to self-define their relationships um, would run into some problems. But I think it's an interesting suggestion. Um, I think a lot of the um, consideration here uh, might relate to what we think the future policy um, is, is, you know, goals or implications are going to be. Um, and I think there's a suggestion that, let, let me ask it this way. What would have been the one smartest thing that could have happened that would have prevented this fiasco? Yeah, someone said it. Locks, put locks on the valves. Put locks on the valves. After this case, when it's decided this way, who's going to have incentives to put locks on the valves? Is Bushy? Maybe not, right? Bushy recovered their damages. Does that mean that the case was wrongly decided? We should have flipped it the other way, said that the Coast Guard's not liable because Bushy's the one that could have taken the cheap precautions by putting locks on the valves. Wouldn't Bushy still have like an incentive to put the locks on the valves considering like it's not like he's going to get the money immediately and he still had to go through all of it. All right, so maybe just to save the hassle of, of litigation, that, that's, that's a possibility. But I think relative to the other outcome, it's going to undermine the incentives there. If a Bush employee had been drunk in and plugged the valves, they would be in trouble as well. Yeah. So maybe it would have just been a smart idea. I think there's an interesting footnote in the case, I don't know if you saw it, that says most dry docks do have locks on their valves. There's also an interesting note that cites a legal scholar, Ron Coase, saying it kind of might not matter who wins this case because if it's efficient to put locks on the valves, they'll bargain to that, that, that outcome. Someone mentioned we might change the contracts and it very will be that next time around the Coast Guard is going to say, okay, we'll do the deal with you, Bushy, we'll have our ships uh, repaired but we want a condition of the contract to be that you will put locks on the valves. So we might get to the sensible precautionary outcome no matter where we put the legal entitlement. Yeah? If most docks have locks on the valves, wouldn't that solve the foreseeable result question? Because if all the other dry docks can foreseeably see somebody spinning the valves who they're not supposed to be spinning the valves, why couldn't Bushy see that? So you're saying, if I understand, um, it's not foreseeable that this, or it is foreseeable that this would happen because other, uh, other. Yeah, like ninety percent of the dry docks are using locks. Bushy's not using locks. So it's foreseeable that this series of events might occur without the locks. I think it's a creative argument. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it would convince me all the way that this was a foreseeable result of what would actually happen because these facts are so unusual. But I, I think it's a creative argument, right? I think it maybe speaks a little more strongly to the fact that there was just some sensible precaution that wasn't being taken here. And maybe we should think about what legal um, result is going to lead that precaution to be taken. All right, I want to um, I want to um, I want to move on. I want to um, you know, we're running out of time and I want to um, I want to ask one or two questions related to sort of the overall um, the overall uh, reasons why we have this this area of the law. Um, before I do though, let me just ask one um, one other final question on this bushy case. Did anyone notice how the two courts differed? We had a lower court opinion, and then we had sort of a, an appellate review. Both courts reached the same outcome, but they did it in a different way. Did anyone have a chance to sort of follow the reasoning of the appellate court versus the lower court and see how they might have differed in their reasoning? Sort of subtle, because we only got the appellate opinion. We didn't get the lower court opinion. Yeah. 
what is the sentence here? It looks like the lower court reasoned that a drunken boat swing may have thought it was in its employer's best interest. Okay. That was an earlier decision that was basically straining the purpose to serve test, right? Which is one of the reasons why you know, this court was a little bit dissatisfied with the purpose to serve and said, that doesn't work really well. Let's go with this foreseeability test instead. Is that a hand? Was it just saying that like the national rule didn't go far enough? Yeah, say a little more about that. Pardon? Say a little bit more about. Well, they felt that like the lower court said that the national rule didn't completely cover it. Yeah. And so the superior court said that the national rule did cover this, but they should expand it further. So there's the expansion of like the presidential law. Yeah, I think that's right. I think the lower court basically looked at the situation and said, huh, we think the old test stinks. We're not going to use it. Right? And so they sort of said, we're going to um, just say that um, there's a much broader rule that's going to be in place. The employer is going to be liable for um, the acts of the employee. And one of the real benefits of that is that employers are often richer. They'll have deeper pockets, and we can spread losses that way. And so the appellate court looked at this and said, eh, I don't know that we can do that. Right? We've got to follow precedent. But then what Judge Friendly I did, I think, was stretch precedent by stretching this foreseeability result. Um, as the test. I mean, it's difficult to know unless you've studied a lot of these cases. This is by far the predominant test. This is a really rare alternative test that was not used very much. But Friendly grabbed it and then started expanding it in order to basically come out, I think, the way that the courts felt justice would be served, but in a way that still might arguably be consistent with precedent instead of just throwing everything out and deciding it on more of a loss spreading policy basis. Okay, let me. Um, Let's skip over the one other case I had, and let's try to come to, I guess, what might be the most important question. Um, you might be asking, why should the principal ever be liable? Or I guess a related version of that question might be the interesting idea you raised. Why shouldn't we allow principals and agents to, any time they want to, disclaim the agency status? Right? You're doing work for me as an employee. But we all agree up front that you're not my agent at all, and you're just doing work for me. Um, and it's possible, of course, that the law is wrong. Maybe principals should not be liable for acts of their agents. You know, maybe the law has just you know, has gotten it wrong, and we should reverse. Um, this is what you're going to be spending a lot of time talking about in law school. right? I mean, we here you know, know what the law is now, and now we should argue whether or not it's right or whether or not it's wrong. So let's think about this. Maybe this whole respondeat superior you know, um, liability for, for poor principles is not right. Um, we might want to think about it with an example. Let's imagine that um, we have a fireworks store. And this fireworks store is being operated under one of three different legal regimes. Um, first legal regime, principal is never liable for the torts of their agents. I own the fireworks store. I've got some people here that are working for me in the store. Um, and you're considering shopping in that store. Would you like to live in that world? Principal is never liable for the torts of his or her agent. And if you're shaking your head, no. Why not? Uh, I, I can imagine like a situation where the employee is negligent and you're injured and there's no way to like, take those costs. Okay. So, Maybe we're worried about situations where you're being harmed by shopping for fireworks, right? And there's just not enough money there to recover. Yeah, in the back. Also, like, in that regime, the store owner and the principal would have no incentive to put in safety precautions okay. to prevent the fireworks from okay. blowing up. So if I own the store, I might say, ah, fire extinguishers, who needs them, right? Uh, my employee policy is smoke anytime you want, right? Do whatever you want. You know, I, I don't care. And so we might worry, right, about some of the incentive to create these precautions along the lines of what we're talking about with the lock. Yeah. I guess there's the question of what if there was a principal with a nefarious intent in mind that they could be not liable for the actions of their agent. What do you mean by that? Nefarious like, intent. I know this is an extreme situation. Okay. Imagine like hiring like a mercenary or someone to do some a hit person or something. Okay. Whatever it could be. Okay. So We'd have to ask whether the decision to hire is a separate decision that transcends the overall agency relationship. I don't think we're saying that you know, criminal conspiracies right, are, are not. We're just talking about you know, this sort of narrower vicarious liability where the principal is going to be legally responsible for 
you know, tortious actions of the agent. But I think I kind of hear what you're saying. I think many of us might be a little nervous about cabining off liability entirely. Um, if the principal is creating the store and creating this business environment, then maybe sometimes they should be, um, should be standing behind what happens. What about the opposite? Principal is always liable for any torts committed by her agent. Would we like this world? Yeah. The agent might not act in the best interest of the principal or might not will take reckless actions. Yeah, very, very well might be the case. Shouldn't have hired the, the agent. I mean, that doesn't specify at all that the torts are being committed during employment. No, they're not. Once you hire an agent, they're yours. You're responsible for whatever they do, ever. Morals, then you're in trouble. I mean, yeah, my mother-in-law would never get a job, right? I mean, <laughs> it might make it really difficult to expand, right, economically. I mean, if I was an employer, I'd be pretty nervous, right, in this world. I mean, look, I think you're really good. Um, I'm happy to have you work here, and I'd be delighted, right, to be responsible for what it is that you do under my rules while you're doing my job. But, you know, when you're off on your own, I, I don't know what happens, and it might make the, you know, economic environment sort of slow down a little bit. So I don't know that we've got it exactly right, but the goal, I think, of this area of the law is to try to basically define this middle ground where we say, um, look, the principal is going to be liable, responsible for torts of the employees that are carried out within the scope of the business, within the scope of the duty of what the agents are doing. And the goal there, I think, is to sort of come up with this you know, compromise position where we're going to provide some incentive to do things in a sensible way related to the business, but we're not going to provide too much fear that that uh, liability is going to spill over into other unrelated activities. I can't tell you that we've got the balance exactly right, but this at least is the major goal. So in the end, the treatment of this, the legal treatment of behavior in this area, is going to turn on little subtle distinctions. I mean, think about how we spent the last you know, 45 minutes. We've been talking about these you know, subtle distinctions here. This might seem funny to you now. It's the type of thing that drives non-lawyers crazy, right? I mean, why do these you know, few things have, you know, control vast legal differences? But in part, this is what you're going to be doing next year, right? You're going to be spending your time understanding what matters for the law and, as importantly, arguing about whether it should and whether we maybe don't have it exactly right and should think about coming up with another approach to regulating various types of behavior in our society. Um, all right, well, thank you so much for being here uh, with us uh, today. Um, I really hope that I'll be able to see you here in the fall.